right? Yeah. Your tutor. Yes. All right, so be sure to come, talk to her. Lucia Simonelli. Uh, let's see, you should wait 10 seconds. I guess 10 seconds have passed. Let's go. So let's start the only class of this week. This is functional analysis. 2019, and this is lecture four, and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the back differentiation and the Hardy. Maximal function. So I hope to finish today this brief introduction of the course. Where in this first four lectures, what I'm doing is a little bit more of building up in your expertise in real analysis. Okay, we haven't actually started the the usual, the classic functional analysis, but in the spirit of this course that I want you to get some, uh, some of the flavor of the main results of, of analysis. And I encourage that, you see in the homework that are some problems where you have to use some stuff that you learn in complex analysis, for example, in one of the exercises. In this lecture, I want to somehow wrap up this introduction. And then next week, we are going to start with the classic Theorems of functional analysis, some of the classic theorems, Hambana theorem, uh, closed graph theorem, and we'll start from there. Now we we'll start from chapter one of Brizzy's book next week. Okay, so we're going to talk now over the next few weeks about uh, Brizzy's book. But as of today, uh, remember this is the only class this week, so your homework is due. Uh, homework is due next Monday, right? This is what we. Next Tuesday, actually, which is February 12th, okay? And by the way, it's our next class. Okay, so you have the week for fun, right? <laughs> you only see me once. Good. Uh, so, a basic review of what we did last time, because I want to pick up from there. So last time, last first class, we talked a little bit about LP spaces. There's uh, subclasses in the LP spaces, the norm, Minkowski's inequality, and uh, in the last two classes we were talking about this object, named convolutions, and what we discussed last class was the approximations of the identity. Please turn off your cell phones. This applies also to the instructor. <laughs> Approximations of the identity. So the idea for this part that we discussed last class was to consider a function, say phi from R D, say to R. Sometimes this function is also called kernel, as I mentioned the other the other class several times, uh, which is let's say your favorite smoothing function might be a function of compact support. And you consider the approximations of the identity as phi epsilon of x and 1 over epsilon to the b, phi over x over epsilon. You know, this, this is really nice in theory, but in the homework I assigned some problems for you to actually recognize this in the real world, and it's not so simple to see it. But once you, you get the drill, you see why it is like this, right? So we define phi epsilon like this, and our idea is to send actually, uh, the idea is to send epsilon to zero and see what happens. So when you send epsilon to zero to these functions, they preserve the, the integral, integral of phi epsilon is integral of phi, but they are graphs. So if the graph of phi is 
like this, supported say minus one one, the graph of our phi epsilon will be supported in minus epsilon epsilon, and we'll keep the area. And we see that this is what uh, usually converges to a direct delta function. So we wanted to understand in the last class the meaning of f convolution with phi epsilon going to your f. So we wanted to understand when this happened. Okay? This is uh, this is what we should expect. Okay? This is what we should expect because this function is phi epsilon. Concentrate the mass around the origin. Even if they are not compactly supported, even if their support is spread all over the space, they will concentrate most of the support, most of the mass around the origin, so they'll behave like a delta function. Right? So this essentially tells me that I should just consider y equals zero, and then y is equal to zero, this is just f of x, right? So somehow this should return me the value of the function, and we understood this in several different ways. Uh, and the ways we discussed was when my function f is in LP, and here I need y less than or equal to p less than infinity, then we saw that phi convergent phi epsilon goes back to f in the LP norm. Okay? Of course, if my function is continuous at the point x, then by continuity, these averages around the point x will converge back to the f of x pointwise. Right? If f is merely in LP, so converge back to the function f in the LP sense. Uh, and there is, so this is the LP convergence. There is another one, which is, I just stated to you in the end of the class, pointwise convergence, which is if our curve, say, is dominated by a... So this will converge to the f if the integral of phi is 1, okay? Integral of phi is 1, they'll converge 1 times f. If the integral of phi is a, they'll converge to a times f. Pointwise convergence is that uh, f involved with phi x will converge to f. Pointwise, almost everywhere, um, if f is a function that belongs to LP, and here I can put really any LP, including infinity, and our phi, say, loses to a certain psi, and this psi is a function that is L1, radial, and non-increasing. Most of the applications, the phi itself will be a radial decreasing function. So this is just for completeness. I didn't, we didn't prove this. We'll go back to this result. But I want to somehow remind you that what we did last class. Is everything clear about this? You saw this in the exercise, how it works in practice. So what I want to call your attention today is to maybe we're going to prove this result for one specific and the most important phi is that if you consider the function phi the characteristic function of the unit ball. So let's see, we're going to take our phi as being the characteristic function of the unit ball divided by the measure of the unit ball. So this has integral 1. So as you may see, I'm just going to take my phi being a step function. Characteristic function of the unit ball. And I define by its volume, by its d dimension of the bag measure, to have uh, integral 1. Okay? So, in a way, this is essentially connected to what we are going to define as the hard little with maximum operator. Let's see. Uh, all right. So, what we 
we want, what we want to look today is to some certain suitable extensions of the fundamental theorem of calculus to functions which are not, you know, continuous or C1 in the classical sense. Okay? So, what is the fundamental theorem of calculus in the classical version? Let's say, if I give you a function f that is a continuous function in the interval a, b, so it's a continuous function in the interval a, b, and we write the function big F of x as just being the integral of little a to x of f of y dy, Uh, then you get that f prime of x is equal to f of x. All right, <clears throat> meaning that uh, the derivative of the integral is the function that is there. continuous functions, haven't you? Okay, so let's maybe start from there. But let me first understand what this is. So when I say that f prime at the point x, this little f of x, what I'm trying to say is that the limit when h goes to zero of say f of x plus h minus f of x over h is this point f of x. And this is essentially the same as saying that the limit, the limit when it goes to not to infinity to zero, when it goes to zero. Now if I change here x by x plus h and substitute in the integral expression and divide by h, what I will get is 1 over h, the integral from x to x plus h of f of y dy. You see, this is what the theorem is really saying. If I don't want to talk about the big function, big f, I just want to talk about the little f. This says that if I take a function little f, which is continuous, and I freeze a point x, and take an average from x to x plus h, and then I divide by h, so I'm taking an average of f, I go back to f of x. This is very reasonable, makes sense. If f is continuous, we can do the proof of this fact. So what I want to prove today is what if f is not continuous? So if the function is merely, say, L1, I want to prove that you still have the same sort of result almost everywhere. That the averages go back to the function almost everywhere. That the derivative of the integral go back, goes back to the function. The fundamental theorem of calculus when your function f is not continuous but merely integral. Okay? Uh, okay. So, let's see. If you talked about absolutely continuous functions, you may have, you may have proved the following proposition, which I'm just going to write here for completeness. So, if my function f 
a, to a b a closed interval, say to r, is absolutely continuous. Then uh, f is differentiable almost everywhere in the classical sense. Uh, and you have and this f prime, the derivative, belongs to L1 of a, b with f of b minus f of a equals to the integral of a to b f prime of b. Okay? So if the function is absolutely continuous, then it is differentiable almost everywhere. And this derivative is an integrable function in my interval, and the fundamental theorem of calculus holds. Okay? So in other words, I can recover my function f as the integral of the derivative. What I want to show today is, what I want to discuss with you is the counterpart. That, okay, so here it says that the integral of the derivative goes back to the original function f if your function f is absolutely continuous. What I'm going to show is that if your function little f, which is in this case f prime, is merely L1, then the derivative of the integral also goes back to the function almost everywhere. Okay, and this somehow complements this result. Uh, you have seen this? Okay, great. Uh, so, our goal for today, our goal for today is to understand understand, let's say, for a little function f in L1, that is a real integral, what happens with the following averages? So I want to take, uh, I want to take, at the point x, I want to take the integral of f of y dy okay so let me maybe let me maybe state this as the theorem that we're going to prove what we have in mind so the theorem that I want to prove theorem 2 which is sometimes called the bag differentiation theorem is the following. Let f be a function which is locally integral. Here I am introducing a notation for the first time in this class. Locally integrable means that my function f may not be integrable in the whole Rd. What I'm saying is that f times the characteristic function of any compact set is integrable. Okay, so f is integrable over compacts. So if you take any compact, f is integrable over that compact. But it may not be integrable over the whole R. So if f is a locally integrable function, then the limit when r goes to zero, then I'm going to take averages of at the point x, I'm going to take averages of the function over balls that, go, let's say, that are centered in my point x. So I'm going to take the integral of f of y dy over the ball of center x and radius r. Okay, and I'm going to divide by the volume m of dr, the volume of this ball. So this is an average of a function f in the ball of center x and radius r, and I, I take this integral and I divide by the volume of the ball. m of a set here denotes the Lebesgue measure. Sometimes I denote the Lebesgue measure with m of a set e, sometimes with the bar e. So if you see these two notations are most commonly used in the books to denote the Lebesgue measure of the set. So if I take the average, but if I take radii really, really small, going to zero, if my function is continuous, if I took these averages around the point x, I should go back to the value of the point, the value of 
f of x, right? If my function is merely lowly integral, it might be pointwise a disaster, but no matter what it is, this is equal to f of x. Now, you put these two letters here, which are very important, almost everywhere. It's not pointwise. Everywhere I result is almost everywhere. You have seen this one, right? Yes. Uh, the proof related to the one, the one which is, uh, for example, integral over, over every interval is equal to zero, if I hold it, it is almost everywhere zero. Yes. Uh, so maybe let me show you uh, a, 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 a few different tricks today, because this will add to our conversation before of, of our previous conversation and maybe to help us in the future conversation as well. So this is in RD. Uh, <coughs> this is the statement that the, the derivative of the integral goes back to the original function because this is essentially what this is here, an average. Let's say here it was just from x to x plus h, but you could if you wanted to do x minus h to x plus h and divide by 2h to put the interval centered here. Uh, so you can either take these balls, I'm taking here balls centered at x, but you could do balls that just contain the point x if you wanted. So balls that contain the point x and the radius shrinks to zero. If you don't like balls and you like cubes, you could do cubes, it doesn't matter. So all of these things are the same, the result holds true if you replace balls centered at x by balls that just contain the point x. If you replace by ball or cubes or for any object that has a certain eccentricity bounded by a ball and below, as long as you shrink the object to zero. These balls can be open, can be closed, it doesn't matter for the integral, okay? So before our discussion, let's say we're working with centered balls at x, and let's say that they are open balls. Uh, now, this will be a nice example, and you see today, hopefully. Uh, that <coughs> that's a nice interplay going on here between geometry and analysis. They talk to each other very frequently and they give nice ideas. Sometimes you don't see, but when you see, it looks a little bit like a miracle. And uh, the most, you know, one of the most difficult things to do is to actually uh, understand the roles that things play in the geometry, geometric side and translate it to the analytic side and vice versa. But you will see this. So, most of the times when we want to prove, this is a pointwise convergence result, right? You want to prove that certain averages, certain objects, converge pointwise to your function. It's a, let's say, a common knowledge in analysis, let's say it's a reasonable idea in analysis to believe that whenever you want to prove some sort of pointwise result, one of the usual ways to proceed is to analyze a certain maximal operator associated to this problem. And you might be trying to prove pointwise results, pointwise convergence results in several different settings. So for example, you might have a partial differential equation, you might have a PDE that you want to prove that it converges to the initial datum when the time goes to zero. You might have the Fourier series, so it was an open problem for a long time to prove that the partial sums of the Fourier series converge back to the function pointwise. I mean, the Fourier series, as we will discuss maybe later in this course, it's an isometry from L2 to L2, so if you have a function in L2, you have the Fourier series, but the question is whether if your function f in L2, if the Fourier series converges pointwise, it was an open problem for several years and ended up being solved by Carlson. Leonard Carlson that gave him the Fields Medal in the 60s. Uh, again, another problem about pointwise convergence where you have to understand something about the maximal operator associated. So what are these, these mysterious objects? 
not so mysterious, but that we call maximal operator. In this case, it is the so-called hardy Littlewood Hardy and Littlewood maximal operator. This is called a Beck differentiation theorem. The Beck published his PhD thesis around 1905. Okay, so what I'm going to Hardy and Littlewood did mathematics after that. So this is 1930, 1920s, 1930s. So the the proof that we're going to present for the result is not actually the original proof of Lebesgue. The original proof of Lebesgue was a one-dimensional proof, but the, the name, the theorem bears his name because he has the original inside. Okay? Hardy and Littlewood are two people, two guys. You usually see them very frequently together because they wrote perhaps half of their papers together. Uh, but there are two British mathematicians, very famous analysts. Very very nice results that they have published in analysis, number theory, and related areas. So, <clears throat> so we're going to define, let's say, for each locally integrable function. So why do I just care about locally integrable functions, f? Because, you see, in all these integrals that I'll do here, I'll just be integrating over balls, over a certain compact set. So I just care that my function is integrable over like some certain balls. I don't, my function could be identical to one, that's okay. I mean, this is not an L1 function in the whole space, but if I want to integrate it over a ball, I'm okay. Okay, so this is the prototype of functions that you want to have in mind, a locally integrable function. Uh, for each f locally integrable, let us define an operator, so I'm going to call m m of f at the point x will be not the limit when r goes to 0, but it will be the, let's say, the biggest possible of these averages. Because these are averages over balls around x. Okay, I want to take the worst possible average. So it's going to be the supremum when r goes bigger than 0 of these averages, 1 over to take the absolute value here. Okay. So if my function has oscillation, I don't care. I will take the modulus here. And I'm going to change the, the limit when r goes to 0 by the soup when r is bigger than 0. So you really want to understand what is the biggest possible of these averages. And the philosophy behind proving a pointwise result like this is to actually prove that a certain maximal operator associated to the problem like this is not too big. Okay? <coughs> Let's see. Uh, so this is a well-defined object. Okay? This supremum might may be infinity at some point, that's okay. But it's I'm just integrating on negative functions, so I'm all okay. So this may be infinity at some points. So this is the so-called hardy little with maximal operator. Uh, now let's see what do we want to show. First, let's discuss this operator a little bit. Okay, let's discuss this operator a little bit. Uh, and I, as I told you, the key idea You see this why this is the case in a bit is to show that M of F is not too is not too big. <coughs> okay. My first question to you all. Let's just take a look. Question one. Suppose I take a function, which is like this. Suppose I take any integrable function f. f actually in L1 of RB. 
an integrable function. Okay? My question, can m of f belong to L1? Suppose I have an integrable function. My question is, can this maximal function still be integrable? this question, which is important, let's try to get the flavor of this operator. It's a good idea to get the flavor of what this operator does. Okay? So suppose you are, let's take the example that you suggested, the characteristic of the unit ball. Okay? So this is my, this is my F. Okay? And it's one here, it's the characteristic of the unit ball. What do you guys think? that the maximal function of f should look like. So for example, if I, if I am at a point right here, I'm at point x right here, okay? If I take a, a small average around x, I get 1, right? Because around x the function is 1. If I started, if I want to get uh, a bit more ambitious and want to get bit, uh, bigger radii, what will, uh, what will happen with this average? It will decrease, right? Because at some point my radius is increasing, but I'm now starting to add up zero. Okay? So at, at these points inside the unit ball, the maximal function is actually equal to one. The best that I can do is to actually take these averages over a small radius to be entirely contained in the ball. Okay? But now let's go far, far, far away. Let's go to a point right here. This point X is right there. Okay, so what's a nice idea to get the supreme in here? What is the size of the radius that I should get? It's uh, the to contain x plus one. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So I have to go to pick up the mass where the mass is. It doesn't make a sense to average around this point x because there's no mass here. If the mass is all concentrated here around the origin, so I have to go there and pick up the mass. So this means that the good radius here, it might be something of the order of x. I don't know if it's going to be x plus 1. X. I, I could pick up the whole mass, and this would make radius x plus 1. But maybe by some optimization, R, I could just go and pick up x plus a half or x plus 3 fourths. might do a little bit better. I don't know. You should do the computation. But, but certainly, your R is, will be absolutely uh, less than x plus 1 and bigger than x minus 1, right? Because x minus 1 is what it takes to get to the, to the mass. And x plus 1, more than x plus 1 is a waste because you're not picking up mass anymore. Okay, so in some sense, your radius is proportional to, to x. So the maximal function at this point should be what? Should be roughly well, you took a radius which is about x, and you picked up the whole mass. Let's say that the mass of this is 1. Okay, So you picked up the mass 1, but then you divide by the volume of the ball that you had to take, which is about x to the d. So the maximum function is about 1 over x to the d. Okay. Now, you see that this function, 1 over x to the d, this is one prototype of an interesting function. This function 1 over x to the d is not integrable in Rd. Okay? So keep this in mind. So when you are working on R, a function that decays like 1 over x is not integrable. It's almost integrable. To be integrable on R, you need x to 1 plus epsilon at infinity. But 1 over x does not integrate. When you are on Rd, it's 
the same thing. A function that decays like 1 over x to the d is not integrable. The integral is infinity, right? This follows by this one, by just uh, you, if you use polar variables, for example. Okay, so to be integrable at infinity on our d, you need actually d plus epsilon. So if you have d plus 1, then you're fine, then you can integrate. But if you have just x to the d, this is an example of a function which is almost integrable, but it's not integrable. So this, this is the reason that, this is why in this particular example, this function m of f is not in L1. It's not in L1, okay? Uh, but everything that I told you guys here is absolutely generic. If you start with a function f, which does whatever, so if your function f is L1, the mass will somehow be concentrated in a big ball here, say minus 100, 100 will contain 99% of the mass, or at least some ball will contain half of the mass. Okay? Then you don't care what the maximal function does here in the middle, but at x very large, this x here will try to pick up the mass. So the radius that I will use, well, I can certainly use, if I use radius around the size of x in this formula, if I use this radius around the size of x, what I will get is half of the mass, at least, because I went to the origin to pick up half of the mass, divided by 1 over x to the d. So this maximal function here will be, say, bigger or equal than a certain constant over x to the d. It will be at least this thing. Because this is what happens when I, I take an x far, far away and I, and I went all the way up to the origin, up to the origin plus 100, but a fixed number to pick up, say, half of the mass. This will be bigger than a constant over x to the d. And this cannot be integral. So the answer to this question is no. As a matter of fact, if I give you any non-zero function, then this maximal function cannot be integral because of this argument. Okay? So it really, my function grows. Okay. Uh, but what do we do with this? So maybe I will erase these graphs so we can proceed. There is a nice, so, so I see, there is no hope to prove, it would be very nice to prove that if my function is in L1, then the maximal function is in L1. So this, this n would be a bounded operator from L1 to L1. But this is simply not true. For any function at all, for any non-negative function, the maximum of function of f does not, is not integrable. But as we have seen, it, it seems to be almost integrable. It's, it's barely in this example here. Okay, now let me... perhaps present to you guys a space which is a weak substitute of L1. So I will introduce to you guys a new space now. And this new space is motivated by this, let's say, Chebyshev, Chebyshev's inequality. <coughs> and I guess if there is anyone here that speaks Russian uh, and complains about my, my, the way I write about Chebyshev, uh, you guys can teach us a, a lesson. I don't know what's the proper way, but once I asked a, a person who you know, knew the Cyrillic alphabet, this, all the Chebyshevs that you see in the literature written in so many different ways, with T, with B, with uh, SH, and so on, these are all attempts to translate what's the original Cyrillic name to the to our alphabet. So these are all the same Chebyshevs. Let's just pick uh, one way of writing Chebyshev and sticking with it, okay? <laughs> I don't know if there is a right way or not, but uh, which is, okay. So if you, if you have a function which is in L1 of Rd, so this means that, well, you define the L1 norm to be the integral of f of x, x over the whole rd, and this is equal to the l1 norm. This is what we define. Okay? Now, uh, 
If I wanted to integrate this, if I, if I now consider the level sets, okay, if I want to integrate, say, this function f of x dx just over the level set where the, 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 the points x in Rd such that absolute value of x is bigger than alpha. Okay, I fix an alpha bigger than zero, and I want to integrate my function, my absolute value of f of x, just on the set where it, it is bigger than a certain alpha. Obviously, by definition, this loses to the whole integral. I'm integrating on a subset. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, this is bigger or equal than the integral in this set, right? Of alpha. Because in this set, absolute value of f is bigger than alpha. Okay? And this gives me what? This gives me. Uh, this is just uh, alpha times the measure of the set where f is bigger than alpha. Okay? So for any, so in conclusion, what this implies is that for any f in now one or rd and any alpha, what you have is that the measure of this level set, the measure of the set where f is bigger than alpha, is smaller than this guy. You guys agree? Okay. So for any integrable function, this is what we call Chebyshev's inequality. The measure of the set where f is bigger than alpha cannot be very big. You know, because my function is integral. So the measure of the set where f is bigger than a certain alpha cannot be very big. And this somehow uh, quantifies this. You can use this with the LP norm as well. So if you had the LP norm, you would find a, a, a similar inequality with uh, LP norm and alpha to the p. Okay? So this is usually this is referred to as Chebyshev's inequality. One of the many Chebyshev's inequalities, okay? Uh, for LP norms. Now there is a space, there is a certain space which we call, you'll see the literature written as L1 weak of Rd or L1 infinity of Rd. So if you see, this is the usual notation to represent the space that I'm going to define now. Either L1 weak, if you prefer this L1 infinity, this L1 infinity will become, uh, uh, you will understand the reason L1 infinity when you talk about certain spaces called Lorentz spaces that generalize the Lebesgue spaces LP. Okay? But just for the sake of notation, let's just call one of these names, let's say L1 weak. And this is the space of functions. So, so look, this is the space of functions F from Rd to R. Measurable functions, measurable, such that there exists a C bigger than zero for which a universal C such that a measure where F is bigger than alpha loses to C over alpha for any alpha bigger than zero. This is my set. Let's understand this definition. It's the set of functions, set of measurable functions, such that I have an inequality like this, with this L1 norm replaced by a certain number c. Okay? It's a set of measurable functions such that there exists a c bigger than zero, such that the measure of any level set is not too big, loses to a c over alpha. And the important thing here is alpha with the power 1. Okay, if you were to talk about LP weak, you would talk about alpha to the P on the bottom. 
this is alpha to the 1. So this is space of skull L1 weak. Why am I calling L1 weak? Because this is weaker than L1. Every function in L1, I just showed to you that it satisfies an inequality like this, with the C being the L1 norm of F. But there are functions that verify this inequality and do not belong to L1. Guess which functions? These M, these uh, uh, MFs? This MF will be, yeah. But the prototype of the function that is in the space, prototype of the function that is in the space L1 weak, it's not in L1, it's this function 1 over x to the d. Okay? 1 over x to the d is a function that belongs to the space L1 weak, but does not belong to L1. We have seen that it does not belong to L1, right? Because it's not integrable at infinity. Well, let's see that the, it belongs to this space here that we defined here. So, so if, if I want the measure where f is bigger than alpha, sometimes I use the absolute value. Sometimes I'll just drop the absolute value if my function is obviously positive. Okay? So the measure of the set where f is bigger than alpha is the measure where 1 over x to the d is bigger than alpha. So and then I do the computation. So 1 over x to the d is bigger than alpha. I will erase this line. If, uh, if 1 over alpha is bigger than x to the d, so if x is bigger than square root d, so 1 over alpha to 1 over d. Okay. So x is smaller than something. So this is actually the measure of the ball. It's a ball. X is smaller. Ball of radius 1 over alpha to the 1 over d. Right? What's the measure of this ball? Oh, the measure of a ball is just equal to a certain dimensional constant, volume of the unit ball, divided by their radius uh, times the radius to the d. So when I raise the radius 1 over half to the d, I get just 1 over half. Okay? So this is just this computation. So this is a function that belongs to the space and doesn't belong to this one. Right? And now the pieces start to get together. Because this is exactly the sort of behavior that my maximal function had at infinity. So I didn't have any hope to prove that my maximum function belonged to L1, but now I have hopes to prove that my function belongs to this space. And this is actually what we're going to prove. So let's write it here, proposition 3. Uh, <coughs> M, my maximum operator, maps L1 of Rd to L1 weak of Rd. Namely, there exists a universal constant C that may depend on dimension, Cd, such that the measure of the set where Mf is bigger than alpha loses to this constant C D times the L1 of F over alpha. Sorry, here's a constant C depend on F, right? Yeah. But has to be one constant that depends on F that holds for any alpha. Okay? So the statement is this, I want to prove that this maximal function takes, takes one function in L1 and it doesn't map too far from L1. We already know that it does not map into L1, but it maps into this weaker space, this slightly larger space L1 weak. And the bound, the so-called L1, L1 weak bound for the maximal function is just the bound that is written here in this box. The measure, the back measure of the set where m of f is bigger than alpha, is smaller than a certain number over alpha. This number has the L1 norm of f here times a universal constant. 
Let's keep this estimate in mind. So this is the sometimes referred to the L1, L1 weak bound for the maximal function. Are we going to talk about the interpolation theorem in this course? Maybe. Would you like to? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful with what you wish for, man. Nah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a democracy. <laughs> so, yeah, so this sort of bounds here from the interpolation theory that we may see, for example, implies that the maximum operator maps LP to LP boundedly when P is bigger than 1. But we'll, we'll come back to that. We will come back. No, this is very interesting too. We will definitely come back to that. But I have to show you some Hambanet space before, some Hambanet theorem and some closed graph theorem before we can go back to this. Because otherwise, we just keep with the fun stuff and never talk about functional analysis. Well, this is analysis. Uh, how do we prove this? Well, this is very nice. And the proof is, is uses this so very simple but very powerful idea of a covering lemma. So this is called Vitalis covering lemma. I guess lemma in English has two M's. Portuguese just one. So now you see how simple facts from geometry will have deep implications in analysis. And the simple facts are, just, are the following. Uh, let, let's say, big B, let's put a crazy B here, just the union of, this is just a collection, the I's, yeah, and N, a finite collection of balls. So take, take a finite collection of balls. Take a finite number of balls. They may intersect. They, they have different sizes. They may do whatever you want. You have a finite number of balls. <laughs> take your favorite collection of balls. I don't say, think this will be the favorite That's collection. Of, that's your favorite collection of balls. <laughs> the Thales Covered Lemma says that there is a universal number that depends on the dimension, let's say 2%, that for any crazy collection of balls that you have, you can always find a sub-collection which is disjoint and covers that percentage of mass. Say, we can find a collection, a sub-collection of these balls which is disjoint and covers 2% of the whole space covered by these balls. Okay, so let B be a finite collection of balls. There exists a universal constant CD, even at zero, and a sub collection. B I J J one to K, let's say B I J J one to K of these joint balls. So these joint two collections such that the volume of these balls, in other words, the sum of the measures of these balls, B I J J one to K, covers at least this is constant CD times the volume of the original set, of the original union of the balls. And this constant doesn't depend on the starting uh, part, right? This constant just depends on the, the, the dimension. Okay, the constant. So I think we should say there exists a universal constant such that for every finite collection this happens. CD just depends 
on the dimension D. You, it will be clear from the proof, okay? The constant CB just de de depends on the dimension. So for any collection of balls, you can find a disjoint subcollection covering a certain portion of the space. So the idea to prove this lemma is rather simple. and rather intuitive. So if you have your favorite collection of balls here, and you want to find a subcollection of these joint balls, which one is the first one that you're going to pick? Anyone? Ooh, the biggest one. Not the biggest, biggest one. It's like you're choosing for a soccer team, right? So if you win, on the, and you pick the best guy for your team. So what you do here is that what you... Huh? <laughs> so. It's a finite collection of balls. There is one which is the biggest one. There may be ties. OK, if there are two, just pick one. So there is the biggest ball. So it, it's, a, it's like an algorithm to prove this. So proof is like, you first you pick bi1 as being the biggest. The biggest ball. That's your algorithm. So uh, let's, let's suppose that this is the biggest ball here. OK? So I pick the, my, the biggest ball there. Do we exclude everything that intersects with it? I will do that. But I will do not only that. I will, I will exclude everything that intersects with this. Yes, that is exactly what I'm going to do. But I will phrase it in this way. So I will pick this ball B I1 to be the biggest ball. So I will denote by B I1 star. So I will let's let's do what you said. Let's uh, let's uh, what we do is that we erase all the balls. that intercept bi1. When I say erase, and I just, I, I just mean disconsider. So erase all the balls that intersect bi1. And note that all such balls are contained in bi1 star, which is three times bi1. So all the, I'm, I'm, I'm defining here a ball star, which is the ball at the same center and three times the radius. Okay? What I'm trying to say is that all the balls that you see here that intersect the purple ball are contained in, are totally contained in the ball bi1 star, let's suppose this is the ball bi1, but why not twice, I mean if, if it uh, intersects with this ball, if I take that twice then it should also contain mm, everything no. that it intersects with. Right. Let's see, if I take one ball here, and if I take twice the radius, I might, so this is R, this is R, 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 I might take a ball, I might have a ball that has radius right here, does this, right? Ah, okay. So because this is the big, the ball with the biggest radius, let's call it R, so I, move, I, I take R and I take R, R, I take three R, all the balls that intersect the purple ball have to be contained, entirely contained in the green ball. Is that clear? This is the powerful geometric fact that I'm using. <laughs> you may think it's simple, but it's not. You see? This is almost obvious, right? But it's crucial that I took the ball with the biggest radius, okay? 
So all the other bones have radius less than or equal than R. Therefore, if they touch this one, they have to be totally inside the ball BI one stop. So you, you, you just did, this is your algorithm. Pick a ball, erase all the balls that touch her, and, and note that they are all contained in this BI one star. And then you, you repeat the process. Pick the biggest ball that was left, okay? which is a ball that does not intersect this BI1 by definition, so it's a disjoint ball. You disconsider, you erase all the ones that intersect them, and you go on, and you go on. So if you, when you do this, a finite number of steps, you have to finish, because your set is a finite collection of balls. All right? There is a way to, to, to deal, sometimes you will see this statement in the literature with an infinite number, with a countable number of balls, there's a way to tweak the argument to consider this case as well, but this is the simplest possible setting. So you obviously finish. And once you finish, the collection, the collection of balls, the collection, say, BIJ that you chose with this thing, that you want to play, is, does the job. Let's see why why it really does the job. It's a disjoint collection, do you guys all agree? By construction, right? The constructed one, I erase everybody that touches that ball, and I picked another one, therefore it does not touch the previous one. I erased everyone that touched this ball, B2, I choose the other one. So by construction, this family is disjoint. Uh, now, the measure of the union of the balls, all the balls, bi, i, i from 1 to n. So at the end of the process, at the end of the process, every original ball has to be contained in one of the green balls. Do you agree? So the measure of the union of all the balls is less than or equal than the measure of the union, j from 1 to k, of the green balls, b, i, j, star. OK? Now, the measure of the union is certainly less than or equal than the sum of the measures, because these, these green balls may have intersections. There's no problem. OK? And then the measure of each green ball, the measure of each Ij star being three times the measure of this ball is just three to the d, the sum of the measures of the ij. And that's your claim. The measure of bij, these joint balls, wins against the total measure by a constant which is one over. 3 to the d. We prove this theorem with constant cd, 1 over 3 to the d. It's a very small constant. If the dimension is 100, 1 over 3 to 100 is a very, very small number. But what matters is that it's a fixed number and it's independent of the collection. And this being true, this is percentage. This, per this is actually a, 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 this is, you see, this is the sort of questions that mathematicians ask themselves. So this is, Let's say this is the value of the constant in this estimate. People started studying, can I prove this? Uh, because there is a similar statement for balls, for cubes, and so on and so forth, right? So in some cases, yes. <coughs> I mean, the, yeah, the size of the constant in this uh, L1, L1 weak uh, estimate for the maximal function, which is related to this. In some cases, when you're not working with balls, but it's working with cubes, you can put a constant which is independent of the dimension. Sometimes there are improvements from exponential to polynomial and this sort of questions. And this question has been extensive in the study. It's not easy, but, but this is a nice problem. You see, this is the sort of problems that appear in mathematical research. Uh, I think, I think it, in this case it cannot be improved. If we take two circles that barely touch each other, yeah, yeah. In, in this case of this particular lemma, may not, but I'm talking about the, 
the constant that will appear in the L1 and one week estimate that we will prove for the maximal function, for example. Okay, which is related to this one, but it's just an implication. This is this implies that we're gonna have the other inequality with a certain constant, which may not be optimal. But yeah, but here you're right. I mean you can take just a just one deep ball and then uh, you can take balls maybe touching it. Well, but even like that, you may not have too many balls. But I have to think about it a little bit. Okay, are we cool? Let's finish the group. Good. Now let's see. Now we have the geometric effect. Let's see how we prove that estimate for the maximal function. So you see, th this class I'm going backwards. I started, I started stating the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, and then I said that I was going to use the maximal function, uh, the, this particular L1 and one week estimate for the maximal function to prove the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. Then I said that I was going to use this Vitali covering lemma to prove the L1 and one week estimate. So, so I'm going backwards, but now is the point that we start to come back. Now we start to we started to prove the x. Okay, so this is the first proof. The Vitali over there. Well, now let's go back. So proof of now I don't remember what's the name of the proposition. What's the number? Four, three, three, three. So we want to prove that the measure of the set or the maximum function is bigger than a certain alpha loses to a certain constant, which I don't know what it is yet. So I want to prove this. Okay. Good. Uh, so let's call this set E alpha. Let us call the set E alpha is the set of points. Let me write very nicely. X belonging to R D such that maximum of F of X is bigger than alpha. Okay. I'd like to prove as an exercise that this is actually a measurable set. So this is actually an open set. Where whenever my maximal function is bigger than alpha at the point x, it's bigger than alpha in the neighborhood of x. Because you're taking averages, you can just move on the average a little bit. So this is actually an open set. Uh, but what, what does it mean? So, now we know the following. So for any for any x belonging to E alpha, what does it mean for a point to belong to this set? It means that the maximal function at this point is bigger than alpha. So there is a ball for any x in this set, there is a ball which we call Bx. Bx is a certain ball centered at x and with a certain radius such that the integral of f modulus of f over this ball Bx and I divide by the volume of Bx so the measure of Bx I am bigger than alpha. Do you guys agree? This is the definition, right? The maximal function is bigger than alpha if, remember, the maximum function at the point x is the supremum of, of averages of ball centered at x. So if this is bigger than alpha, there must be one ball that is bigger than alpha. Okay, so for any x in the set, there is a ball. There may be many other balls. If there are many other balls, just pick one. There is one ball, bx, such that the average of absolute value of f over bx is bigger than alpha. Okay. Now, we want a statement about the measure of the set. Okay, we want the statement about the measure of the set. So what I'm going to, to do is let K contain in the set E alpha be a compact. Take a compact set inside the set E alpha. Now you see that K is certainly contained in the union of such balls Bx and X belongs to B alpha. Do you guys agree? Let's say, let's say my balls are open. Okay? 
from the beginning I said that my balls were going to hit. Excellent. So I'm taking a compact. Of course, the set E alpha itself is covered by this union of these balls, because these balls are indexed by x belonging to E alpha. And of course, if k is inside E alpha, k is inside this union of these balls. A compact set being covered by a union of open balls, everything, all that I can use is that. So there exists a finite subcover. Let's say k contained in the union of b. Now I'm going to come back to the notation. Let's put b i, i from 1 to n. Now we're going to use the Vitali lemma, so using Vitali's covering lemma, there exists Bij, j from 1 to k, this joint such that, well, statement of Vitali covering lemma holds, so measure of some of the measure of Bij, j from 1 to k, wins, right, so it's 1 over 3 to the b times the measure of the u, right? Let's see how do we finish here. Uh, so I want a statement about the measure of k, right? So the way to go is that to say that the measure of k is less than or equal than the measure of this union of bi, i1 to n. And from this inequality, the union of bi loses to 3 to the d sum of the measures of Bij, j1 to k. Now each of these balls, recall that, recall that the integral of f in each of these balls, bij, if you divide it by the measure of bij, this was bigger than alpha, right? Because these bij's are, are, are certain balls of the original balls, this bx. So this inequality holds. So if I move this bij to this side, this implies that 1 over alpha times the integral over bij of f is bigger or equal than the measure of bij. So if I use this, and if I use this, so I have here star and I have double star, so I plug in double star into star, and I continue my chain of inequalities here. This will be less than or equal than 3 to the d over alpha, the sum, right? J plus 1, okay, integral of Bij of absolute value of f, right? Since these balls are disjoint, this loses to the integral of the whole f in the whole space. Okay, so you end up with 3 to the d over alpha L1 log of f. This is what you wanted to prove. Right? This is the L1, L1 weak estimate for the maximal function. So, so if this holds, if the measure of k 
is less than this number for any compact inside your set E alpha, then this holds for the set E alpha itself, because our sets can be approximated by compacts from inside. Okay, another property of the Lebesgue measure. So we end up proving what we wanted to prove, that the measure of the set E alpha is less than a certain constant divided by alpha times the L1 norm of F. And this constant that we, we prove this inequality with constant 3 to the D. This is usually the constant that people care when uh, they try to optimize. And then this, this may vary from when you take the centered maximal function, the uncentered maximal function, if you're taking balls or cubes. One of these cases. But right. here we just put the, the measure of k, and we need to put the, the measure of e alpha, right? Yes, this is what I'm arguing, right? So if, if, but if you prove this for any k inside e alpha, mm -hmm. you pass the limit because e alpha can be approximated from inside by compact sets. Okay. Is that okay? You saw this in real analysis, I suppose, right? So Another property of the bag measure. All right, so we have 10 minutes. We'll finish. Uh, sorry? Go ahead. Uh, does it, don't we require that the alpha uh, is, has a nice measure to be able to do this? So, no. This is actually part of this proof. So, so you start with your set E alpha. In principle, you don't know that it has finite measure, right? It could, it could have infinite measure. But if you prove that for any compact inside, the measure of this compact is bounded by this number, then your set has to have measure bounded by this number itself. Suppose your set has uh, measure infinity. You could certainly find a compact set there inside with the measure 100, with measure 1,000, with measure a million, right? So this would contradict this inequality, because I'm giving you a fixed number. Think about it. So in other words, the, the measure of a set, the measure of a set E, is the supremum of the measure of K, where K is compact and inside E. Okay. If you want monotone convergence, or dominate, uh, yeah. A monotone convergence system. You can, you can actually make a, an increasing, increasing sequence of compact sets that are inside. So you can use the monotone convergence theory for this. Uh, can I erase here? Yes. Go ahead. Huh. This part. Yeah, I wish this board were, were bigger. Okay. Let's see. So to finish, I wanted to prove our theorem 2. Level differentiation. Let's, let's see how all of these pieces fit together. Uh, remember, you wanted to prove, you wanted to prove that I'm going to write this and be very slow. You wanted to prove that the limit when r went to zero of one over this was f of, was f of x almost everywhere. saying that the limit when r goes to 0, if I just move the f of x to this side,
average over, over the integral. This is a constant for this integral. This is equivalent to this guy. Now, if I want to prove that the limit of a certain quantity that has a sign is 0, it suffices to prove. So I'm going to write a sign that is this. What comes in implies this one. That the limit when r goes to 0 of 1 over r. I'm going to prove a stronger thing. That this is zero almost everywhere, right? So almost everywhere. I'm going to prove that this limit when r goes to zero of the averages over the absolute value of f of, f of y minus f of x, dy goes to zero almost everywhere. So if the limit with the absolute value goes to zero, of course the limit without the absolute value goes to zero as well. So this implies this one. So this is a stronger statement. Note. So let's call this one star. So all the points for which star holds are called of f. So when you hear this expression, the back points of f, these are all the points x for which this statement here star holds. Remember that this, this back points of f appeared in the statement of the last result in the last class. I said that something holds almost everywhere. I said, in fact, it holds at all the back points. So what we are going to prove with that is that almost every point is a back point. Okay, we're going to prove star. Good. So let us prove star. So let us define Let's see, we already called we already called EA in the previous proof. So let's call XA given alpha. We are given alpha bigger than zero. Call XA X alpha to be the set of points X belonging to RD such that this is not true. It's not true by alpha. So, in other words, such that the mean soup when r goes to zero of these averages is bigger than two alpha. Okay. So I am calling x alpha, the set of points in Rd, such that the limb soup when I go to zero in R of this average here, and I get above 2 alpha. Okay? You will see in a minute why, do I, why I put alpha here and 2 alpha right here. It's just for aesthetic purposes. So what I have to prove, I need, I only need to show that the measure of each of these sets x alpha is zero. Right? Do you agree? Because star holds on Rd. Let's say Rd except the union of x alpha when alpha is a rational number. Right? Because if, if star does not hold, then this limit is not zero, but this is a non-negative function. So if this limit is not zero, the limb soup cannot be zero. The limb soup would have to be bigger or equal than a certain alpha, and the function would be 
that this point x will be in a certain x alpha. Right? So if I prove that the measure of each of these x alpha is, is zero, then I can just use that star will hold on the complement of all the union of x alpha with alpha is rational. I take a countable union of these guys. And I argue that this set will also have measure zero. So star will hold almost everywhere. Okay? So all I have to show is that the measure of this set is zero. Okay, so now what you do is you take, you start, remember, you started with f, you started with f in L1 low. We started with a locally integrable function f. Now, observe that this statement, this statement here is a pointwise statement. This is the limit when r goes to 0. So this just takes into account the information around a, a certain point x. Okay, So I can just, instead of working with f uh, in L1 log, I could just work with uh, f times the characteristic function of the ball, uh, a unit ball of, say, radius n. So if I can prove the result for f times the characteristic function of the ball radius n, meaning that proves that the average when r goes to 0 go back to the original function, then I set n to infinity and I obtain for almost every point in rd. Okay? So this is a local result. So I can assume without loss of generality, I can just assume without loss of generality that f is in L1. Okay? Just assume without loss of generality that this, uh, f is in L1. Again, I'm going to say this again. If my function is uh, something like this, crazy, and I want to prove that uh, these averages go back to the point almost everywhere, I want to prove that it goes in minus 10, 10, almost everywhere here. And here I just have to look at the function inside this piece, because these are averages when r go to 0. So this space doesn't care. So my function could be this, and I can prove that it holds almost everywhere in minus 10, 10. Then I'm in business. So if I want to prove it from minus 20 to, to, to 20, then I just look at the function from here to here. Okay. So what I'm trying to show is a local result. So it doesn't, it is not harmless to just truncate my function. So you can assume that your function is in L1. Now, you choose a certain g, c infinity of compact support, if you want, that approximates f in the L1 norm. See? So, you just rewrite this. So, given epsilon bigger or equal to zero, arbitrary, we choose a g, c infinity of compact support, such that G approximates f in L1. By the way, I told you in the first class that the C infinity function C infinity of compact support uh, or dense in LP in L1, uh, what you could do, now you already have the power to do this. So you start with the function in L1, you just truncate it at a certain number, say radius 1 million, that is very close to the original function in the L1 norm. Now you take this the truncated function, and you do the convolution with the C infinity uh, kernel, C infinity of compact support kernel. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the resulting convolution, when you do the approximation of the identity, will be something that approximates this truncation, that approximates the original function, and that has the regularity of the kernel. Mm -hmm. okay. By using the approximations of the identity, you can already argue that you can approximate functions in LP by C infinity of compact support. Think about it. Okay, so you take your function C infinity of compact support that approximates f in, in L1. What I want to say is that, now let's just keep this guy here. In five more minutes and we're done. Uh, you see, I want to write 
this. Okay, so I want to write this integral. So maybe I write it. So one over measure of the R integral of the x f of x minus f of y. So this is I want to write that this is less than or equal than this quantity. Now we're going to play that trick of inserting our g here and breaking this into three pieces. So it's f of y minus g of y, y plus g of y minus g of x plus holds point-wise for any x, right? This holds for any x. Uh, this guy is less than this plus this plus this. Now I can take the limb soup on both sides. Limb soup and R goes to zero. The limb soup of a sum of three things is less than or equal than the sum of the limb soups of each thing alone. So this slim soup on this side will be will lose to the limb soup of the right hand side, which will lose to the limb soup and I goes to zero of each of these things. Okay? Alright. Now, there is one here in the right hand side which is simple. Which one is simple? This one in the middle here, right? My G is infinity of compact support. So if my G is continuous, this limb soup here, when I shrink the radius to zero, this will go to zero. Okay, so this in the middle is zero. And what you get is that this limb soup here is less than or equal to two limb soups. So let me write. So let us write. We call this y alpha, let me call, we call this x alpha, let me call y alpha the set where x belongs to Rb, where this slim soup here on top, and r goes to zero. It's bigger than alpha. Just putting an alpha there. And let me call Z alpha the same thing here. Where I have here G of X minus F of X. Bigger than alpha. set x alpha was a set where a certain limb soup was bigger than 2 alpha. This limb soup loses to this limb soup plus this limb soup. And I, I'm defining y alpha is the set of points x where this limb soup is bigger than alpha. And here I'm putting alpha again. Here I'm putting 2 alpha in the beginning. Here I'm putting alpha and alpha. What my claim is that, it's kind of an obvious claim, is that this set, uh, which I'm calling x alpha, is contained in the union of y alpha union z alpha. Do you see? So if, if this object here, if this limb soup is bigger than 2 alpha, then one of these guys has to be bigger than alpha. Okay? 
So if my point x is a point such that this guy is bigger than 2 alpha, it's in the set x alpha, then either this or this has to be bigger than alpha, because if this, were, if this plus this is bigger than this, then it's bigger than 2 alpha. If two numbers are bigger than, the sum of two numbers is bigger than 2 alpha, one of them has to be bigger than or equal than alpha. So this set is certainly contained in the union of these two. This means that the measure of this set loses to the measure of y alpha plus the measure of z alpha. You see, now let's take a look at what these sets are. We have that. Uh... What do we have for z alpha, z, y alpha? If y alpha here, look, I have, I have f of y minus g of y dy. So this thing here, this limb soup and R goes to zero. So I, I note to you that this set y alpha is contained in the set where the maximal function of f minus g is bigger than alpha. Do you agree? If the limb soup and R goes to zero bigger than alpha, the maximal function of f minus g is just the soup of this thing. So if this is bigger than alpha, of course, the maximal function is bigger than alpha. But we have already seen that this set is not very big, right? This implies that the measure of y alpha loses to the measure of this set. And by our previous lemma, the measure of this set was less than a certain constant times the L1 norm of this function, f minus g, divided by alpha. one piece. The other piece, z alpha, is I should not have even have written like this. I already did something very silly here, but because this integral here is just, this integral is on y and then x is fixed. So I'm just taking an average and divided by the volume of the ball. So z alpha is essentially the set, it's just a set of points x such that f of x, so f minus g is bigger than alpha. And this, f minus g is an integrable function. This is the first inequality that I showed you in the class today, how to, uh, to, 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 to bound the measure of a set like this. Right? So it's the measure of a set where an integrable function is bigger than alpha. This is Chebyshev's inequality. Loses to the, a certain constant, loses to actually the L1 norm of the function divided by alpha purely and simply. Okay? So if we put this together, so if we put this together, what we get is the measure of your x alpha loses to c. Now this, this f minus g was chosen to be epsilon over alpha plus another epsilon over alpha. Now recall that your alpha was fixed in the beginning. The c is a dimensional constant. And your epsilon was arbitrary, right? So if this is smaller than this for any epsilon, this has to imply that the measure of the set x alpha is zero. Since epsilon was arbitrary, right? And then this proof is complete. Okay? There was a lot to absorb today, I know. But you see, take a look at this material, this is for fine stuff. And uh, you learn a little bit of the ideas that are here, some powerful ideas here. Some simple observations in geometry and covariance leading to nice observations in analysis. There's a lot of collateral results that we use today, this chap charge inequalities, the definition of these LP weak spaces, and so on. But the bottom line is that you really do have this, this uh, so Vitalik geometric fact, Vitalik covering lemma implies this L1, L1 weak estimate for the maximal function. And usually a, so, some sort of boundedness for a maximal operator implies a pointwise convergence argument by this proof that we did of picking to alpha, approximating by a dense class of so, uh, a dense class of functions where you know that the result is obviously true. So this is what we use here. 
and then we break it in two, and these two we know how to control here by the classical jab chair, here by the L1 L1 week that we put for the maximal function. And then we get this nice result that the averages converge point-wise to the value of the function almost everywhere. This is a particular case of the statement that I gave in the end of the last class, where I, sh I claim to you that this holds for all, a lot of kernels, but I will show today is that this holds for the characteristic function of the unit ball. There's one proof for a general kernel where you can actually bound, use this fact to prove the other kernels. And I might leave this to you as an exercise. There was a lot to di digest. Take a look at these things and uh, study this. Um, uh, that's it for today. We'll see each other on Tuesday. next Tuesday, guys. Have, you all have a great week. I'll be going to Rio for the week and back on, on, on Saturday. Uh, yeah.